So uh, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our uh, MRV training on um, the transportation sector. Uh, we're delighted that uh, you're here, uh, both physically and for those of you who are viewing over uh, the internet uh, virtually. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is start off our training with an introductory lecture about uh, climate change and transportation. And uh, this will hopefully set the stage uh, for a broader discussion um, about uh, how we can uh, measure, report, and uh, verify emissions in the transportation sector uh, and uh, what types of mechanisms might be out there um, to help get uh, climate finance for the transportation sector. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, just set up our, our outline. Our outline uh, is going to be, the presentation is going to be divided up into uh, three sections. Uh, the first section is on uh, sustainable low carbon transport. And, and what I'll try to do in this first section is uh, argue, especially uh, in a developing country context, uh, it's incredibly important that the sustainable comes before the low carbon. So um, a lot of the benefits that you might get uh, from a uh, low carbon transportation system like uh, reduced greenhouse gases are secondary or tertiary or fourth on the list um, compared to some of the other uh, more um, important development benefits. Uh, so I'll set that argument up, um, but then what I will also suggest moving into the second section is to highlight that um, there are potential mechanisms out there that can uh, help get climate finance to help achieve not only the climate benefits, but also some of these development benefits. So that'll be the second section. And uh, then I'll close by uh, talking a little bit about um, MRV and uh, transportation uh, NAMAs. Uh, MRV refers to measurable, reportable, and verifiable. And uh, NAMAs, uh, if you're in Japan, NAMAs refers to actually uh, beer, uh, but in the climate change negotiations, uh, NAMA refers to uh, nationally appropriate mitigation actions. Okay, so um, that's the basic outline, and um, let's start off with the, uh, the first section on sustainable low carbon transportation. Okay, the, the first point that I really want to emphasize is Coming from uh, a climate change perspective, uh, when climate change negotiators think about uh, opportunities for reducing greenhouse gases, they are recognizing more and more um, that transportation is really, really important piece of the puzzle. Um, transportation sector accounts for approximately 13% uh, of uh, global greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, this is when you put in uh, forests. If you would take out, and, and agriculture, if you would take out forests and agriculture and you were just talking about uh, energy related emissions, then that figure comes closer to about 23 or 24%, so almost a quarter. Um, so it's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, and some people would suggest it's an extremely important piece if we're going to keep greenhouse gases at a level that's safe. Okay, this uh, chart that you see right here, a uh, diagram, is from uh, some scholars known as uh, uh, Pakala and Sokolo uh, from Princeton University. And what they did is they set up uh, what they call this stabilization triangle to try to show um, where or how much you need to reduce over a 50 year period between 2005 and 2000 and uh, 55, uh, how much you need to reduce over this period to make sure that your temperature rises don't go over uh, two degrees, okay? Two degrees from pre-industrial levels. And this triangle is really nice because it, obviously it looks very, uh, uh, very easy to sort of visualize. And the other nice thing about it is you see the triangle is broken up into many smaller parts, right? Okay, so within this stabilization triangle, there are uh, wedges. And in this case, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wedges. And each one of those wedges 
uh, relates to one gigaton of uh, CO2 um, per year by 2055. Um, the important thing to recognize here is for those different stabilization, those different wedges, um, at least two of them uh, can be from the transportation sector. So there's two possible smaller wedges that can come from the transportation sector that can make up this larger triangle that can make sure that climate change will not reach dangerous levels. They actually identified 15 possible wedges in many different sectors. Two of them are in the transportation sector. Once again, underlining how critical is important, how critically important it is to think about transport when we try to solve the climate change puzzle. Okay. Now, just to say that it's critical is a nice thing. Um, but the other thing that we want to talk about, too, is it's not easy. Okay. What we've noticed, even with countries that have been trying to reduce their greenhouse gases um, over the past 20 years, that the transportation sector has proven uh, very, very difficult. Um, and what this chart or diagram shows you are the reductions you see in uh, Europe. So out of all of the uh, parts of the world that have started to reduce their emissions, um, the European Union has arguably made the most progress and um, been uh, most committed to this goal. But what you can see is, uh, with the exception of what they call Lulu CF, that's the land use, or international bunkers, um, this is fuel that's used uh, for um, uh, maritime for ships. Um, with the exception of those two, um, there's only been one other sector where emissions have actually increased in Europe, and that's the transportation sector. So Europe has generally done more than most parts of the world, but they've also struggled with the transportation sector. So while we know that according to these mitigation wedges, there's a significant possibility there, and um, we know that it's an increasingly important part of the puzzle, it's a puzzle that we really haven't solved yet. Okay. <coughs> and it's a part of the puzzle that will be um, something we'll be thinking about a lot in Asia, not only now. So many of you that are here and many of you that are hopefully watching um, are directly involved in this, uh, this, this quest to try to reduce emissions. Um, and I'm sure, as many of you are aware, this is also a big challenge on the ground. Okay, um, this chart right here just shows you what might be the potential uh, increase in emissions from uh, 2000, well, starting in 1980 shows you what emissions already look like, and all the way from 2000 to 2050 demonstrates that uh, we could get up to four gigatons per year of CO2 uh, coming from Asia in a BAU. BAU stands for business as usual scenario. Uh, and if we want to go down this, what they call low carbon transportation scenario, um, we could potentially keep those emissions to about 1.5 gigatons per year. Okay, all of this is interesting, and the people that have worked on demonstrating this potential um, spend a lot of time behind their computer entering in figures and trying to make nice looking graphs to sort of summarize this well for, uh, for people who don't know a lot about transport. Um, but the, the interesting thing is, as many of you might also know, is that these graphs can only take you so far. Uh, what we really need to take a look at is what's happening on the ground. Okay? And what's happening on the ground um, is uh, it's not really accurately or not easily captured by some business as usual or low carbon transport. Okay, what we see happening on the ground is, um, for instance, the fact that, uh, that much of Asia is rapidly motorizing. Okay, this is important. Um, the speed of this is important uh, because it's very difficult in some ways to capture this type of rapid motorization in graphs like I just showed you. Uh, especially in medium-sized cities, uh, less so in mega cities, but especially in medium-sized cities, we're seeing that the vehicle fleets are often doubling uh, within five to seven years. So I remember very, very clearly, actually, when my colleague and I, uh, Jane Romero, who works at the Asian Development Bank now, when we first started doing this type of work, 
we went to Wuhan, a city in China, and we were trying to understand how Wuhan was taking or measuring, reporting, and verifying um, their emissions. But to do that, you need to know how many vehicles you have, right? And the um, colleague, we were at Wuhan University, the colleague at Wuhan University was explaining to us that in order to do this, you need to take a survey of your vehicles um, every five years or so. Um, and I guess you can do the survey every year, but it's a, just a small sample, and then a, a more sophisticated survey every five years. But the problem was, if you do the survey every five years, then it takes another two or three years to actually run through the data and make sure it's accurate. By the time you've finished getting that data, your vehicle population has already almost doubled. All right, and so it's extremely difficult to capture what's going on on the ground. And we'll talk a little bit more about these challenges, um, especially given the rapid rate of motorization as, as we move forward. Okay, the other thing that I want to add into this that's not easily captured by this low carbon transport or the mitigation wedges are some of the other uh, costs that you get from rapid motorization and some of the benefits that you get from uh, mitigating, uh, not only mitigating GHGs, with more sustainable type systems. Okay, one of the big things that we see in Asia now is uh, time lost in, in commuting. Um, there are figures coming from, for instance, uh, Seoul, Korea, which suggests that 5% of national GDP um, is lost due to time in, caught in traffic. And uh, once again, not to you know, draw all my examples from China, but I remember when I lived in China for a year, I used to have to go to a research institute that was approximately 12 to 14 kilometers away. And it would take about two hours or so on a given day. Um, and if it rains, much worse. Um, and so that's a lot of time lost. And, and what you see happening is people trying to recapture some of that time by working in buses and whatnot. But at uh, any rate, it's, it's expensive. It's very expensive. And a, a lot of times, especially at the city level, um, this concern is a lot more important for city level policymakers than your GHGs. Okay. That's one thing. The other thing that we're also seeing a lot of now uh, is uh, air pollution. Okay. Um, so a lot of uh, um, sort of one of the major and most costly impacts of rapid motorization um, is polluted air. And what we're beginning to understand is that those impacts um, in many ways are more expensive than even your time lost, uh, especially for vulnerable parts of the population, elderly, uh, children, who can be particularly susceptible um, to poor quality air. Uh, and we see this in part um, because of the, the increase in motorization, but it also this is partially caused by the fact that vehicles a lot of times are um, what are known as uh, super emitters, meaning that they haven't been repaired in a long time. And uh, so when they function, they function a little bit like the um, graph that, or the picture that you see right there. Um, this is particularly problematic for heavy duty vehicles if they run on diesel, uh, because the emissions from diesel can really cause problems for people's health. The other issue that's drawing a lot of attention recently is, um, and from the uh, World Health Organization, is safety. And so this is a bit of uh, just a, a bit in jest. Um, but uh, what we've seen is that when there's not adequate transportation systems, people want to move about. And a lot of times, homegrown solutions can be unsafe. Um, we're seeing growing amounts of traffic fatalities in developing countries. As I mentioned, this is a particularly big target area for the World Health Organization. But I think we're also seeing at the city level now, city level policymakers recognizing that people get hurt in traffic accidents is not so good for the city itself. Um, and uh, as, it becomes more as it becomes more of a political issue, there's a growing emphasis on safety. Uh, one of the things that my colleague Alvin will talk about later when we start working on this team tool is uh, some of the safety impacts. So you'll also take a look at some of the impacts of uh, when you move to a BRT system, how that could potentially improve, improve the safety of your transport system. And then this is also a bit in jest. And this is from uh, actually a slide from a colleague, uh, Lee Shipper, who is a very, very famous uh, transportation specialist. 
um, and in many ways set the stage for a lot of the work that's being done now. Um, but what we also see is, in many contexts, that while governments are becoming more aware of these things, um, many times the, the temptation of motorization uh, overrides concerns about pollution, time lost, um, and safety. So we see signs like this that don't run across the road that might confuse the motorists. Okay. Okay. Um, in, in Asia, there are many drivers behind this trend. And um, when I say drivers, I'm not only talking about the people that are uh, riding the two-wheelers here, um, but they're actually broader forces that are driving this, this trend. Um, this picture right here is taken from uh, Hanoi uh, in Vietnam. Uh, and it just demonstrates to you the fact that the, these cities have tended to grow outwards over the years. And generally speaking, there's a sort of vicious cycle here where what happens is um, as cities begin to grow quickly, uh, a lot of the jobs in the cities uh, come, become appealing to people from outside the city. <coughs> so there's a lot of urban migration. But when you have urban migration, a lot of times the land use values in the city start to go up, making it very difficult for people to live very close to their work. And so what happens is the only way that people can live um, affordably within the city is to build on the outskirts of the city. And when people build on the outskirts of the city and the transportation system cannot accommodate this growth, then you have people uh, having a demand and need for, uh, for their own transportation. And a lot of times this is met, especially in Asia, with two-wheelers. Um, I'm just going to make a very brief comment about two-wheelers as well. One of the things that we found really challenging, especially with uh, MRV models that have been used in the US and uh, Europe, is there's not a lot of uh, room there for two-wheelers. And as many of you know, two-wheelers can be the dominant mode in, in, in Asia in a lot of places. Um, so yeah, in some ways, we've had to refine some of our models. And, and Alvin will bring in some of this when he talks about the, the team model as well. My colleague Toto will talk a little bit about two-wheelers in the context of electrical vehicles. OK, and we see this not only in Hanoi, but um, this is a map of a city that many of you are familiar with. Uh, this is Bandong. Um, and this is from a, a book project that uh, some colleagues uh, and I worked on. Um, colleagues were from AIT. Um, but one of the points that they were also making, too, is that in the, some parts of Bandung, you have good uh, mixed land use planning, relatively dense, but the city has tended to grow outwards. Um, and uh, this has put more of a strain on the transportation system and led to some of the dynamics that we've seen uh, elsewhere. Okay, um, part of the reason that you have this, this vicious cycle um, it is not only because policymakers are, are maybe not as aware of these things as they should be, but from the city to the national level, um, there can, t can be some differences in goals. And frequently at the national level, you have uh, policymakers wanting to uh, set up uh, subsidies for fossil fuels to keep the prices of fossil fuels low. And um, the idea of subsidies is really not a bad idea. Um, but we need to be very careful in how we tailor subsidies to different parts of, uh, of society. So if we're talking about sort of the, the, the poor segments of society, if we can target subsidies to the poor segments of society, then that's not a bad idea. But t generally speaking, subsidies t tend to be introduced in a very blanket type manner. Um, and it creates this sort of, as I was mentioning before, this, this vicious cycle where the subsidies reduce the price of fossil fuels, keep them relatively low. People have more of a demand and need for motorized transport because they're settling outside the city, so they want to keep the prices of um, fossil fuels low as well. And you get this sort of growth outwards. Okay. Having said all that, um, and it, this just sort of brings me back to the point that I raised before, that a, a lot of times when we take a look and we start moving away from the stabilization triangle, the mitigation wedges, the business as usual and low carbon scenarios, and start looking down on the ground, that rapid motorization itself is more of a development problem than a climate change problem. And so what we're going to talk about as I move through this discussion a little bit 
is not just climate change, but and, and not just low carbon, but sustainable low carbon transport. And the idea that sort of nicely captures this is uh, what are called co-benefits. Um, have you guys heard of co-benefits before? Yeah. All right. Uh, for the past seven years, I've been doing research on co-benefits. So when I come home at night and I speak to my wife, we talk about co-benefits. <laughs> Uh, it's a great conversation. I mean, she, yeah, she really loves it. She really loves it. Um, but the idea behind co-benefits actually started in uh, developed countries. And the notion was really that if you could have a project, uh, for instance, some uh, new bus system uh, in the transportation sector, well, that project might be able to reduce your greenhouse gases, which is good, um, but it also might have other benefits economic benefits, so it might generate new jobs, uh, social benefits. It might ar allow for uh, greater mobility, especially for maybe uh, women or the poor. Environmental benefits, reductions in local air pollution. So these co-benefits are really nice because, especially in a developing country context, but even a developed country context, mm, policymakers are hesitant to invest in greenhouse gases, because those benefits are long-term, they're pretty uncertain, um, and uh, um, they're pretty global. They don't really, they don't really accrue to the, the local area. And so there was a lot of discussion about co-benefits and how can we achieve co-benefits, especially in transportation sector where there tends to be a lot of these co-benefits. But what we've seen over time is when we start to move in a, into a developing country context, is many of the things that we're calling co-benefits um, are actually the primary benefits. And so many, many ways, the entry points for discussions about low carbon transport uh, many times are the jobs that you're going to be able to generate, or the faster commuter times that you're going to get, or the greater equity in society that you might get, or the reduction in local air pollution. So the policies that might help address these issues many times are going to focus on those benefits first, and then the co-benefits are actually your greenhouse gas reductions. So when I said at the very beginning, sustainable low carbon transport, just want to keep that in the back of your mind, that sustainable comes before low carbon a lot of times. And especially when you're talking to policymakers um, at the city level, I think that's really important. OK, so uh, thank you very much. And uh, <coughs> we're now back to the recording. And we just had an interesting discussion about uh, some of the policies that are being uh, proposed and implemented uh, in uh, Bandung and uh, Makati City and Pasig City uh, and Ho Chi Minh uh, City. Um, and actually, uh, many of the things that we talked about, uh, such as uh, public transportation upgrades or uh, non-motorized transport, car-free days, um, a lot of these things have been organized in uh, to this, uh, what we call the ASI framework, the ASI framework. Uh, this framework actually came initially from, uh, from Germany, uh, where it was represented by something other than ASI. Um, I don't know the German equivalent, but maybe my colleague Andreas can help out with that at some point. <laughs> um, and uh, the ASI stands for uh, Avoid, Shift, and Improve. Avoid, Shift, and Improve. And I'll define this in a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, but I also want to sort of highlight that this ASI is not only helpful for organizing different policies, uh, but it's also going to be useful when we start talking about MRVing some of the emissions from transport sector. I'll make that connection as we go through. Avoid, shift, improve. Okay, so this idea of avoid really refers to avoiding unnecessary travel, typically through uh, better urban uh, planning, but it can also capture things like uh, car-free days. Um, and uh, the emphasis is really on uh, making sure that we have good uh, mixed use, mixed land use uh, planning. And uh, we see this in some cases in Asia with the emphasis on uh, eco cities or compact cities. The example I give to you right here is from a city in uh, Japan called uh, Toyama City. Uh, which is a very interesting case, um, in large part because for a long time, the transportation emissions from the city used to be very high. 
And this was because the city had began to grow um, outward and people then to access uh, services would have to drive into the city. Uh, but over the past uh, five to ten years or so, there's been a strong emphasis on densifying um, the uh, structure of the city and making sure that people can get around uh, without the use of personal transport. Uh, so you see, for instance, this uh, uh, monorail right here. Um, and what this is called in uh, Japanese uh, is sticky rice ball planning. Um, that's not the Japanese term for it. Uh, but as you can see in the uh, upper right or left-hand corner, depending upon if you're looking straight forward or standing on your head, um, what you can see in that corner is this uh, sticky rice ball, right? Um, and the idea here is that you really have uh, sort of dense areas of, uh, of um, essential services, uh, leisure, shopping, uh, home, and school. And they're closely connected to stations. Uh, and then you have some um, uh, spoke uh, which, uh, or public transportation system, um, which then links you to another area where there's a dense uh, clustering of, of services. Um, and so the stick is really the public transportation system. And the, the rice dumplings are the, uh, the pedestrian areas around those, those systems. And we also see this idea uh, being discussed more and more in Asia. Uh, it's not easy to do, and there are a lot of challenges to this, of course. Um, but uh, at least the idea has, uh, s has stuck in some, some places. So this is very much along the lines of the avoid. Avoid unnecessary travel through improvements in land use planning. That's where the avoid comes from. Okay, the uh, shift. Uh, the shift refers to a modal shift. So try to shift to the most efficient modes of transportation. Um, this is nicely captured by the uh, growth of the bus rapid transit systems. So we talked a little bit about the fact that uh, Bandong has uh, two lines for their bus rapid transit system. Uh, the picture that you see right here, um, I believe, is in, uh, in Jakarta, in Indonesia. Uh, and this is the Trans Jakarta bus system. And uh, once again, the bus rapid transit has a lot of other benefits besides reducing greenhouse gases, faster commutes, quality services, uh, and especially uh, in contrast to subway systems, uh, lower cost, much lower cost. Uh, and um, this is not to say that uh, bus rapid transit is a silver bullet. Uh, it can be very challenging to implement effectively, but this is an example of shift anyways. Um, and this chart right here just demonstrates um, the potential for shifting. <coughs> what we do see um, in Asia is, uh, and this, the, just to describe what's going on in this, uh, this chart, is um, on the uh, y-axis, we have the modal share for uh, private modes of transportation. And uh, then on the, um, on the x-axis, we have the per capita GDP. So we see as many cities begin to develop, they follow basically three different paths. Uh, the North American path. So unfortunately, I've lived in a lot of these cities. Uh, Los Angeles, not such a great place for uh, public transportation. Washington, DC, Chicago. Um, that's the path we're trying to avoid. Uh, the European path is a little bit better. Uh, but the most efficient path uh, is exemplified, actually, by some of the cities we see in Asia, Tokyo, Hong Kong. Um, also, Amsterdam, which has a very strong reputation for uh, bike um, and uh, non-motorized transport. Um, but what we also see in Asia is a lot of the cities that, as they're still at the sort of developing point, they have a sort of a critical decision to make. Um, and the shift option is very much uh, on the table. Um, in many cities, even though at low income, many cities already have public transportation system but need to be upgraded to make sure we head down the most efficient pattern. And then the last <laughs> one is the improve. So improve refers to improving the uh, energy efficiency of the vehicles or the vehicle technology. And so this usually comes at the end of ASI. Uh, this is an example of a Tata vehicle in India, an EV, uh, which has, typically has lower emissions uh, but there can be some challenges with the improve. Uh, one of them is it's going to depend upon where those, that electricity is coming from. So if that electricity is coming from coal-fired power plant, 
that's not going to be so low in emissions. Um, and then the other one, from a co-benefits perspective, is uh, uh, personalized vehicles can be uh, very convenient, but at the same time can also create more congestion and make it uh, more difficult to get to certain places. So um, there are some drawbacks with, uh, with the improve. Okay, so I'm just going to sort of summarize what I've, what I've said so far and then sort of gradually move into the next section and ask for some, some questions. Okay, um, so first of all, uh, the transportation sector will have a big impact on climate change. And you see a lot of people talking about the transportation sector uh, in climate negotiations. So the recent negotiations in Warsaw, Poland, had a whole day that was devoted to transportation called uh, Transport Day. Um, but for most transportation planners and most city level decision makers, transport is first and foremost about development. Development comes before low carbon. Okay, um, so this is why sustainability comes before low carbon. Um, it's also the same reason we need to think about flipping or inverting the co-benefits approach. Um, then this ASI summarizes very succinctly the key elements of a sustainable low carbon transport strategy. Um, my colleagues that are here in the audience did a better job of even summarizing what's happening in their cities. Um, and as you also exemplified from our discussion, uh, many cities in Asia are in a good position to introduce uh, the avoid and the shift. Um, and uh, then this is going to lead me into the next section where we'll talk about some potential to get support from international climate regime or from bilateral assistance to help fund some of those efforts. <laughs>